What brought you to the field of business ethics? I came to the field of business ethics fairly serendipitously. I was teaching at a very small college in Switzerland, and I was teaching all the philosophy courses. I was teaching political theory. I even once taught a math course, heaven help us. And, uh, but I came, when I came back to Chicago and got a job offer at Loyola University Chicago, a Jesuit university, they asked me if I could teach business ethics. Well, I said yes, which was a lie frankly, because I, I figured I taught ethics, political theory, I could do this. At the same time, Tom Dawson came and they asked him the same question and he had the same answer even though neither of us had any idea what we were agreeing to. And it turned out the course was required for all undergraduate majors and they hated it. These students, last semester seniors, were tied to their chairs and mean looks and they just hated it. So we knew we couldn't teach the syllabus, which had been created by a brilliant woman from Duke, but had no cases at all, except Supreme Court cases, which were not edited, piles and piles of these, and a few uh, philosophy articles that would make anyone go to sleep. So Tom found a book called Business and Society, and we, be we taught cases, and we taught a case in every single class. And of course, that changed the course because students thought this was really cool. I don't know if they thought Kant was cool, but they certainly liked the cases. So down the hall, there was a guy who, I mean, we were new. We were new and young and naive. And he was down the hall and he said, well, you know, he said, why don't you use a textbook? And we said, well, there's not a textbook. Well, he said, just change, you know, like Ju January 10th to chapter one, chapter two. So we did that and sent it off to Prentice Hall and they accepted it. And that was pure luck. And so it became one of the first anthologies in business ethics, and that put our name on the, shall we say, the, well, the headlines, if you want to call it that. So that's how I began. What did you expect to accomplish? Well, of, I was young and naive, and I thought that anyone who took this course would, of course, get it, and they would become very ethical in business. And that went on to one of my students, a student went to jail, so I knew something was wrong here. And then I, so I had to change my expectations. And I realized that there are always a few people who will never understand this. And there are always a few bad apples, but most people are pretty good. And if I could raise the awareness of those people kind of on the edge who are asking questions, if I could change their minds, even a few minds, that that would be at least a decent accomplishment not a perfect accomplishment, but that was all I could expect, actually. You've already spoken to goals and expectations. Are you okay if I go to the next question? Or sure. do you want me to no, go ahead. Me? Okay. What did your university think that you would accomplish in your new role? Well, we started out at a Jesuit university, and so they expected that their students would become more ethical. That was one of the points of a Jesuit university. And as you know, much of business ethics started by the Jesuits and Jesuit universities. And I just want to put in that note because sometimes we forget that. Um, and so they expected their students to be all ethical. Uh, well, as I discovered, of course, they weren't all. Uh, and I, I also, by the way, went, went to Notre Dame for an interview and they said, well, we don't need ethics because they're all Roman Catholics and so they don't, they're all ethical. Well, I said, that's perfect except for the mafia. Well, so that was a bit touchy and I didn't get the job, <laughs> but, but it happened to be true. Uh, who were, by the way, the mafia were very serious Roman Catholics. Sorry to say. Did your goals and expectations change over time? And if so, how? Uh, yeah, I think they did. I think my expectations that everyone was going to be ethical have changed because they are not. Uh, I had a student uh, who got, again, got a good grade in my course and went to work for Enron and thought it was just a terrific uh, company and didn't blow the whistle, even though he was with top management. That was a, a disappointment. Uh, so I, but on the other hand, there have been other students who've called and said, thank you, thank you, I learned something, I've changed my, the way I do things. Uh, so yes, my expectations have changed. The other expectation I had and I still remember saying this. When I first started teaching in the late 70s, I told the students that the two, two of the big issues, which were equal opportunity and diversity, and also environmental issues, that by 2000, 
there would be no problems with diversity. We would all be integrated. We would all have equal opportunity. We wouldn't even bother to talk about it anymore. Everyone would have opportunities. Women be in the top positions, people of color, uh, minorities. And, but the environmental issues would be serious. What's changed, of course, is this is 2019. And just last night, a young woman came to me and she said, how can I succeed in this male world I'm dealing with? And this is 2019. It's not over. And so that has changed my expectations. On the other hand, and that will be part of another question, I'm sure, that the environmental issues at least are becoming right on the front page, right aware. And so I think we've done some good work, obviously not perfect, but we have really raised the bar on raising those issues, much to my surprise. Looking back, what have your contributions to the field been, and for practitioners, what have you accomplished? Yes, I think they, they go together. I have, I have done a lot of work on Adam Smith, the 18th century political economist, and I have, I would, sounds too simple, translated him into thinking about how he applies to business. And I've discovered, of course, that business people, if I talk about Adam Smith, they think, oh yes, yes, he's, he's a free enterprise capitalist, and he was, except he was also argued that justice was the very basis of all economic systems and of all, of course, companies. And, and the humanize, humanizing of commerce was one of the things he argued uh, over 200 years ago. And to take that and put that in a business context, I think that can be successful. And I also, I, had, I have two other accomplishments. I, well, I don't know if they're accomplishments, but they're issues I've raised. And that is, the first one is the idea that of mindsets or mental models, that we look at the world through lenses. We can't take in all the world. So we focus, and the, pro and the good part is we do that and do it well. The bad part is we sometimes miss a train that's coming across the track and I'm on the standing there. And that, I think, creates a number of ethical issues of, of just people not being aware that there's something going on over here when I'm looking here. And uh, so I think that that to just make you aware that I'm always, I'm always focused and I've got to look around I think that's, that's an important kind of issue. And then I think my third contribution is on the idea of moral imagination, that once you look around, then you can step back and think carefully about these issues and, and take another view. You can never take a view from nowhere, but you can get another perspective on that. That's another, uh, another reason to read Adam Smith, because he said that a couple hundred years ago again. 200, 220 years ago, actually. So those are the kinds of issues that I think are important. And I think if you, if you can just get any of that, that that, that might be a contribution. Uh, another uh, sort of, I would say, unfinished accomplishment. Uh, I'm one of the first people to think about organizational ethics, that is business ethics in healthcare. As we all know, just by going to the hospital, everything is moved into, into organizations. Our doctors, our healthcare system, our, the whole thing is in organizations. And, and in those organizations, there are obviously health issues, but there are also business issues because those, that the hospitals are run by managers. They're not run by physicians. And, and so there are all these issues, and, and I've written about that, and Andy Wicks has written about that, but we haven't made any dent, very, very little dent in the healthcare thinking. And I think we have a lot more to do. And I don't understand why those people doing healthcare ethics or, or medical ethics don't realize that these issues are, are important because they interfere, they can interfere with good healthcare or they can promote good healthcare. Whatever it is, it's an organizational issue. And frankly, uh, although we've both written on it, we haven't received enough attention, she said modestly. We haven't received enough attention, and we should, because this issue is critical. Uh, what theories have you developed and contributed to the field? Well, I would think my uh, theory of, of, of moral imagination is certainly what I'm best known for, to help to encourage managers to think, to look at what they're doing and stop and ask very simple questions like, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Just because we've always done it this way, maybe there's something amiss, or maybe that's good. 
and then try to think out of the box into new. There's a lot of new work on institutional entrepreneurship, which is talking about managers in institutions who take entrepreneurial, uh, you know, sort of out of the box, maybe even weird positions, but how much many of those people can contribute to organizations, particularly in this, this era of change where everything is just moving so, so quickly and some companies just miss, miss the target. So Pat, what aspects of your career in ethics are you most proud of? I think two or three things I'm most proud of. The first is I started Business Ethics Quarterly and my colleagues said I would need uh, $200,000 to start that and the poor little Society for Business Ethics dues had only collected 20000 So I partnered with Al Gini at Loyola University and he was a real Scrooge about money, I mean that in a complimentary way, and we started that journal on $20,000 and an assistant we were given, Loyola gave us an assistant. They gave us no money, which is all right. And, uh, and the journal has flourished. And we started with asking people we knew to do articles. So our first issue has all the big names in business ethics. And then after that, people began submitting and so on. And so it's now grown. It's 30 years old now. And uh, I think that's a great accomplishment. Uh, the second accomplishment is at Darden, along with Ed Freeman, we, there, was a, there was a doctoral program, but they, it was not a doctoral program in business ethics. And so when I got here, I discovered there was a doctoral committee, so I just went to the meetings, and it turned out nobody cared about this. So I said, well, that's fine, I'll just take that over, and we started a doctoral program in business ethics. And that has been extremely successful, and we've got, had some fabulous graduates for which we're all very, very proud. And the other third thing is, while I started this program, I wanted to be sure our students became professionals. Not merely thinkers, but I wanted them to go to the Society for Business Ethics meeting, and the Academy of Management meetings, and, but I wanted them also to do presentations. So I started something called the Emerging Scholars, at the Society for Business Ethics, that is just going strong. The first year it was just six Darden students. Now we have 20 to 30 students, and they turn students away, and they do papers, and it's such a great program, and I, I'm very proud of that. What were some of the initial big questions that you faced when you entered the field? Some of the initial questions, I, I think I've touched on some, certainly on diversity, equal opportunity, uh, environmental issues, uh, not so much global issues. And perhaps I had thought about those. Uh, and then, uh, although my, some of my colleagues disagree, I'm still interested in what is an organization? What is its status? What is its moral status? And it's not the same as a person, of course, but I think you could talk about collective agency, and I think that's very important to do that. So if you think of a corporation as a collective agent, then it has moral responsibilities, and we want them to have moral responsibilities. So I, I think, I th so those are the kinds of issues that I wrestled with. And the, the fourth issue, which I had forgotten to mention earlier, is the idea of the self. Who am I? And how am I as a manager? And how could I make changes? This, this really uh, concrete sense of the self and how the self can actually change. And I think that's really important for students to realize they don't have to be mired in a particular organization or in a particular way of thinking or even a particular religion or, or culture that they can, they can work their way out of that. And I, I think that's important for students. We spoke to this earlier, but I didn't know if you had anything that you wanted to add about the questions and issues we still face today. The questions and issues we still face today are, of course, diversity. We still have huge environmental issues. But the good news is I think most companies, uh, most organizations realize that. They're not quite sure what to do about it, but they, they get that. They get it that it's an issue. And I think that's, in fact, I happen to think one of the important things that business ethics has done is raise awareness. We, sure, we haven't made everybody good. Of course, we haven't solved all the problems. But we, but it's aware. All companies are aware they have ethical issues, and and the the second thing that we, the, the third, I guess, diversity environment is that we're moving. We have moved 
into a global economy. Everything we have, we wear, we do is made from all places all over the world. This camera that's taking my picture is probably made in 12 countries, this parts. And so we are global, like it or not. So then how do, we, how do we adjust our thinking? Because most of us are from Western industrial countries. And how do we adjust our thinking when we go into a new, a new culture? Uh, one of my colleagues just came back from, from uh, filming the, the, uh, uh, some tribes in, in Namibia. And they, they're, in another, they're playing another ball game we don't even know about. And it's so important to, to realize that. That how do you, you know, what, how do you deal with that and, and still make some economic progress? So I think that's a huge, huge issue. And I don't think we've done it very well yet, by the way. Is, is doing business ethics a new profession? Uh, I would say no. That the business ethics is not a new profession. Business ethics is part of the whole academic, uh, academic life. It's a focus in academic life. I, I, so it's part of the, prof if you want to call it a profession, of being a professor. What is new is this, this idea, our managers professionals. And so far, that's, the jury is out. But I would argue that the professionalization of management might make a difference in ethic. I don't know if it would, but it might be, it might make a difference. And that has not occurred. Questions about ethics and corporate responsibility have we been able to deal with coherently? We've dealt with some issues coherently, and I've probably mentioned that. First of all, by by writing and, and business ethics, even though managers don't usually read our, our fabulous prose, uh, we've raised the bar. Everybody is aware, all companies are aware, all small companies are aware, all over the world, people are aware about ethical issues, that they're part of business. And I think that's a huge accomplishment. People, th I don't think we can underestimate how how well we have done in that. And that's why we are, we're, the company are so aware of environmental issues as well. We've raised that issue. And diversity is the same, companies are aware, they're just not sure how to do it. So we don't have the how to do it yet, but we've, we've certainly done a good job in raising awareness, I would say. What issues and questions need to be addressed over the next 20 years? One of the things I think we have to think about, particularly those in industrialized nations, uh, is that the globalization is increasing the number of countries that are part of the industrial complex. And, and, that's, and if that's huge. And if you think of it as a diamond, where the industrialized nations are at the top, and, the, and there are fewer of them, then this increasing uh, middle of countries that are that are becoming emerged rather than emerging and then of course down at the bottom these extremely poor countries that I I don't know what's going to happen to them that that diamond I think is going to change to a reverse pyramid where we're going to have many many more countries competing at the top and I'm not so sure we're going to be at the top and I think we better think about that how we could adjust ourselves to a, a much more diverse, much more global, much more, we're going to see many more forms of free enterprise. And we have seen that already. And I think we need to be really, really aware of that and figure that out. So you've been called an Aristotelian. I'm just curious to what mm -hmm. extent you think of Aristotle and Plato as business ethicists. And if so, what's uh, why or why or why not would you call them business ethicists? Why are Plato and Aristotle business ethicists, or are they? I think that's a very good question, and I wish I had a nice, crisp answer. But but most philosophy goes back to Plato or Aristotle, and you could usually stretch something to do that. For Plato, I would say it's the notion of the self. He talks about the soul. Now that's people don't talk that way so much anymore, but he certainly raised the question about who is the self. And I think that, as I said earlier, I think that's an important issue. And Aristotle, of course, raises lots of, in Jacobean ethics, lots of questions about ethics and virtue. And what is a virtuous person? What is a virtuous company? Even what is a virtuous nation? And those issues are always nagging us, even though they're not addressed always in business ethics. So yes, I, they have, 
roots. They're, they're behind us is our roots, if you like. Last question. Medical ethics got started by a singular event. Business ethics, it's harder to pin down what really started it. How has it impacted the direction of the field and um, how people in business ethics have seen what they do differently, perhaps? How, is bus how did business ethics get started? Uh, it, and medical ethics got started with one event. I think it was at the University of Washington, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that, that triggered us after the Second World War to think about ethical issues in medicine. And, and that, then that got started in us thinking about applied ethics in general. Not just business ethics, but engineering ethics, uh, professional ethics, political ethics, which we haven't done as well on, of course. But, but that got us started. So business ethics kind of morphed from that in a way. And then I think all the scandals, finally we began to realize in the 60s, uh, all the business scandals that were kind of not, they were ignored. And people thought, well, that's just business. You know, they would just put up with that. And then we began to think, no, no, we don't have to put up with that. And business doesn't have to put up with that. We can make lots of money and be ethical. There are too many companies that make plenty of money and are as ethical as the best they can do, shall we say. So, so I think it kind of morphed from that, from the idea of applied ethics and then then with the scandals, particularly in the early 1970s, some people trace it back to Watergate. Well, Watergate is a political issue, it's not a business issue, but never mind. Uh, it, did, it did spur the Olson family, Watergate spurs the Olson family in to give money to Darden to start the Olson Center, which is rather interesting because it's a center for business ethics, but that's all right. We're not complaining.